Hey guys, today we are going to be talking a little bit more about logical access. Definitely a huge and very important topic, especially in domain five. Logical access is the primary means to protect any type of information assets. And by information assets, we mean anything that's related to data for your organization. That's the asset that we want to make sure is protected. Basically, if you think about a building, you want to protect everything that's inside the building. Well, before you even try to protect, you need to know what are the points of entry to that building, because you cannot just start building things around if you don't know where are the points that anyone could get inside into the building. So definitely you're going to have, for example, your front door. You may have your side door, back door, probably the windows. Also a point of entry is not a typical point of entry but someone can get inside from the windows. Also the rooftop, someone can, let's say for example, go on a chopper, depending on how big the building is, or just take a ladder and go from the rooftop down into the building, or potentially going from the underground. So those are the places, just in this analogy, where you have to think about it, what are the different type of accesses, entry points, to any type of data and information system servers, networks, and so on. Because all of this is a huge interconnected um, scenario. I think about it like as an onion type of peeling, where you have the center of the onion and you have layers covering out of layers. And you will have the protective layer and then another one that goes a little bit more protective and then another one. So it's not that you only have one single access, you try to create also that layer that gives some sense of security and also some complexity into the entire network. With that, let's go ahead and jump into this quick topic. So definitely, as mentioned, logical access is the primary means to protect information assets. Most of the things that we want to make sure that we are aware of is the identification, authentication, and authorization of users. Also, you have to remember that usually we have three different types of controls. We have preventive controls, detective controls, and corrective controls. All of these controls are going to help you protect those assets but before you even try to put controls, you need to understand what those risks are. And in order to understand what the risks are, we need to understand the IT environment and to understand the technical exposures. Technical exposures are basically what it will call the risk of someone trying to get access to some of your resources. And that type of access could be internal or external users. Internal users mean that the own employees that they already have access, they try to either exploit their access or trying to gain more access. It could be either accidental or unintentional. Same way goes for external users. They could either get access to your system potentially accidentally or most of the cases are usually intentional. Now, one of the greatest things that CISA wants you to make sure you understand, and I've seen also just by auditing multiple clients and talking with a lot of my clients, most of the times when fraud happen is not done by an external party. In many cases are the internal employees, the ones who try to exploit some type of access that they shouldn't have in order to take advantage. So it's an intentional type of act. And why is that happening? The most typical reason why that happened is that those users already know the system. Those users already know the network. They already know what are the weakest points and they know how to go through all of that, of course, for any type of personal gains. That's why you have to make sure that whenever you're taking the CISA exam, you don't discard that internal users are as much of a risk from certain perspective as external users. That's why you have to make sure that you cover all the points of entry. Now, when we're talking about internal users, it's not that you are not, as a company, you're not going to trust your own employees. You want to make sure that they only have the access that they need to in order to perform their job duties. With that, let's take a look at some of those technical exposures. So for example, they could either implement or modify data. Let's say, for example, if they have access to your database. Well, they can just put more data over there. Hey, we made more sales and suddenly sales are part of a compensation for a certain employee. Now they're going to have a better compensation, right? Now we're talking about money over there, right? Locking or missing 
uh, misusing user services, meaning that, hey, probably you're using a service on a server that shouldn't be using. Destroying data, compromising system usability, distract process resources. Similarly to the previous one, where basically you use the resources to do something, and now the computer is busy doing something that they are not supposed to be doing. Spying on data flow, users, network, systems, basically your entire network infrastructure and how you do business by itself. Data leakage. The interesting part of data leakage is that sometimes they don't leave any trace, depending on what type of systems you have in place. So it could go undetected for many, many years. A lot of cases over there where companies didn't realize data has been leakage until like months or years when actually someone else, potentially competitors or clients, tell them, hey, your data is out there on the internet being sold in the black market type of scenario. They didn't even knew about it. Computer shutdown usually is something that you assign as a really high level privilege for administrators of a system where they can shut down their computers for whatever reason that needed to be. Of course, you don't want that someone maliciously shut down your entire process. Now, here the interesting part, some systems as a part of a cell proof, cell part of a proof safe of their system, they will automatically shut down if the system overloads. So potentially a malicious actor could try to overload a system and force a computer shutdown. Of course, there are more other technical aspects to all of these areas, but these are some of the, uh, the important ones that you need to understand as part of the CISA. So now that we understand what are the technical exposure, What's the role of the IS auditor? While you are over there, definitely you're not over there to implement the controls, to implement the procedures or, or standards. You're over there to evaluate. Evaluate what? Let's take a look over here. So over there, you need to determine what are the different areas of risk exposure. Because in order for you to develop an audit plan, you can not look for the entire universe. You have to do a risk analysis from there you need to check what risks make sense and from there perform your audit procedures. So definitely you need to look first for the entire universe and do a risk analysis and determination to see which areas are the highest risk that you are going to be evaluating as an IS auditor. But at the same time, you're going to be helping because you're already looking for all the areas, all the entry points to your building, right? All the entry points to your assets, to your information assets, you can also help management to identify all the paths to that logical access, basically all points of entry. And that's very important because if management is not capable of identifying all points of entry, it could be that they are missing a higher risk because now they are missing a point of entry that could potentially be exploited. That's why the IS auditor could also help management to make sure that all points of entry are being identified and all of them are being addressed on some way or another. So what are some of the general points of entry? There are usually two points of entry, generally speaking, on a very high level, network connectivity and remote access. Network connectivity means how users authenticate to the network. Usually it's through a domain controller server, or sometimes it could be on different devices like the router and firewall. So make sure those points of entry are being covered because if someone were to have access to the domain controller, they could potentially create users to access themselves or basically look at where the users and try to impersonate someone with access. Now on the other side, we have remote access, which basically needs to be very extensive. Remote access, now you don't know, you cannot control certain aspect of that remote remote access. So you have to make sure that is correctly controlled and you know specifically who are the users that can connect remotely to your servers, to your network, and even potentially doing some type of blacklist and whitelist where you know which IP addresses connections should be happening. So with that, I hope this section on logical access will help you understand a little bit better that definitely information assets is a very important topic for the CISA. And over here, I just went through some of the high level topics and areas that you should be aware of. With that, if you have any questions, leave it below and I hope to see you on the next video.